You're watching a message from Redbud Baptist Church featuring Pastor Carlos and your host. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas. We have two services, 9 a.m. service called Traditions and a more modern worship at 11:11 a.m. we like to call Bridge. We're a going church, growing disciples. Enjoy the message. Thank you, team. You may be seated. <coughs> Over the next several weeks, I'm going to encourage you to invite somebody to come to church. I don't know if you're in the regular habit of inviting people to church, but Sylvia and I do everything in our power to make sure that we invite somebody to church. It's important to invite people to church. A statistic that was uh, made several years ago says that <clears throat> most of the people that never come to church say that they don't come to church because no one invited them to church. And I don't know how you receive that. You can either take it personal um, or you can take it as a challenge. I take it as a challenge. <clears throat> if the reason they don't come to church is because I didn't invite them, then I'm going to go invite them because they need to be in church. There are people all around you that need to be in church. They just do. They need to come hear God's word. They need to fellowship with other believers. If they're not one, they need to hang out with people that can show them that there's a different way to live. And um, so it's important to bring them and invite them to church. When we were growing up as a young family, we were taught to not only be uh, to be bringers and includers. And uh, what that meant was <clears throat> is to personally get involved in inviting somebody to come to church. And if they can't make it <clears throat> for some reason on their own, you drive by, pick them up, bring them to church. And... Uh, and then include them in whatever it is that you do in church. So many people come and visit churches every Sunday uh, only, <clears throat> only to experience not being uh, included in their, their uh, or your circle of friends or people or whatever. <clears throat> Just this week, I heard of a couple who visited our church and said that uh, or something along the lines of the reason they didn't come back is because um, they didn't feel included. They didn't feel welcome. And uh, just a few weeks ago, we talked about how great of a church we are. And we really are. I really think we are. But don't let it happen because of us. I want to challenge you. Invite somebody to come to church with you. Over the next several weeks, we'll preach some evangelistic messages, I hope, that these messages will fall on ears who need to hear them. But we're also going to talk about why we need to do evangelism, why you need to be evangelistic. Uh, I am not <clears throat> of the persuasion, as maybe some pastors are, I don't know many of them who are, but I know a few, but I am not of the persuasion that it is the pastor's job to be an evangelist. Uh, the lesson, the Sunday school lesson that we'll uh, learn uh, today uh, in our Sunday school class is about all of us being called to be uh, evangelists, to win people to Christ, to share the gospel. Um, and while we, many of us, are not specifically set up part for being an evangelist, <clears throat> we do have the responsibility to share the gospel with other people. So, let me, hear, let me ask, go ahead and ask the question that many of you are probably dreading that I ask this morning, but I'm going to ask it because I want the Holy Spirit to convict all of us, not, not just you, uh, all of us. But I want to ask you, this week, did you share the gospel with somebody? Did you share the gospel with somebody? 
If you didn't, let me encourage you to do it. Um, when you get out of practice, it's hard to get back into something that you've done before. Just ask anybody, even handing out pamphlets that have the gospel on it. If you quit for a time, it's hard to get back in the habit. Uh, habits are hard to develop, but once you develop them, they are hard to give up. So you've got to be careful what habits you develop. Many of us in church these days have gotten in the habit of not sharing the gospel. We don't think it's our responsibility. We don't think we have time. We don't want to make time. We simply don't think it's our task. And I'm here to tell you today that it is your task. And it is one of the tasks that we are going to be held accountable before the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. We're going to give God an account for what we do and what we've done. Um, invite somebody to come to church. It's okay if they say no. Because they didn't say no to you, they said no to God. I want to start out <clears throat> by reading to us an amazing story. One of the most powerful stories in all of the Bible. One of the most challenging stories in all of the Bible. And you find it in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And I want us to read verses 1 through 7, and then I'll read the rest of it later. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Would you stand with me as we read God's Word, if you are able? <clears throat> this is what it says. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria. And so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. And it was about noon, and a woman, a woman of Samaria, came to draw water. Lord, thank you for this scripture. Thank you, Father, for the story and for the experience. I pray, Heavenly Father, that today, by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, you would convict us that sometimes we go places, we do things, because you want us to be there. You orchestrated our schedule in such a way that we're supposed to be there. There's someone there that you want us to meet. More importantly, there's someone there that needs to hear about Jesus Christ. And maybe, Lord, it starts with an invitation to church. Maybe it starts with a conversation about God. I don't know. But, Father, I pray that in this room today, at a very minimum, Heavenly Father, you would make us aware of our surroundings and that nothing that happens to us is by accident. Nothing that happens to us as your children on this earth is by accident. That there is an orchestration going on sometimes that we don't fully understand or comprehend and may not ever know sometimes. But there are people around us who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you quicken our spirit to such a realization and to help us realize that, oh, I'm here because of that. I'm here in front of this person for that reason. And then I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would empower us. Empower us, Lord, to speak of the greatest story that has ever been told, of the greatest Savior, the only Savior who has ever lived, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Let me read to you the rest of the story, at least verse 10. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. And he would give you living water. So what we have in this story, first of all, is that it is the longest recorded conversation that our Lord Jesus Christ ever had with anyone. You won't find a longer conversation that Jesus has with anyone longer than the conversation he has with a Samaritan woman. I don't know about you, but that's significant. You see, one chapter before, Nicodemus, the religious leader, came to the Lord Jesus by night. And from all appearance, that was a relatively short conversation. This one takes place in the middle of the day by a well. And from all accounts, it is the longest conversation Jesus had with anyone. That alone, ladies, should tell you something. The longest Jesus ever spoke to anyone. Ladies, you'll be glad to know that Jesus loved to talk. Even more important, Jesus is listening to the Samaritan woman respond to his observations and questions. If you read the story, Jesus is carefully listening to the Samaritan woman. He doesn't dismiss her. He doesn't ignore her. He doesn't avoid her. He doesn't go fishing or any of those things. He sits and listens to this wonderful, precious soul who comes to the well to get some water. Jesus is paying attention. This is a good opportunity for us to remember that God puts people in our presence sometimes for us to listen to what they have to say. Listening doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything they say. It simply means that you listen looking for an opportunity to enter into a conversation where you might be able to either share the gospel or talk to them about something that they need to hear. Jesus took the time to listen to the Samaritan woman. I want to remind you that this was no meeting by chance. John tells us in verse 4, he had to travel through Samaria. This is no accident. Jesus didn't just decide to get up and say, I think I'll go through Samaria today. The Bible clearly tells us that he had to travel through Samaria. And while the disciples may not have known fully why he had to go there, I want you to know that Jesus Christ knew exactly why he had to go through Samaria. This wasn't the only time in the New Testament where Jesus says that he must go through a particular location. And even when it came close to his death, the Bible tells us that Jesus knew, and he said, when it came time for Jesus to go to Jerusalem, the Bible says that he set his face steadfastly toward Jerusalem. Jesus was always on mission. Jesus was always on mission. Never forget that. Jesus was always focused on where he was to be, with whom he was to be, and why he was supposed to be there all the time. And church, we can learn something as we begin and continue to try to disciple people. Those of you who are discipling other people, remember that everything you do with somebody ought to be an opportunity for you to teach them something, to show them something, to mentor them in some way. Jesus never went anywhere by accident. Jesus was on a mission on that particular day. And as some of you may know from your study of the Bible, Jews did everything they could to avoid traveling through Samaria. 
So we have to ask ourselves the question, are there places that we avoid? Are there areas in your community that you avoid? Are there stores that you don't go to? Are there places that you just don't go there for whatever reason? Places you just don't go. May I suggest to you today that you might want to reconsider that? You might want to reconsider that. I'm not suggesting that you and I abandon safety or that we waste time. Just simply that God may have you and I go in a direction that you were not planning on. Has God ever redirected your plans? Did you ever think that you were supposed to be somewhere when all of a sudden you were somewhere else? Did you ever ask God why I'm in that place, why I'm here? If you do, God may just point out to you the reason why you're there. It may be uncomfortable. It may not be the place you wanted to be. It may not be the people you were wanting to talk to. But maybe, maybe for whatever reason that we'll never know, God chose you to go there, to do that, to fill up your car at that location or to go to that store when you intended to go to this one for whatever reason. Maybe, maybe it's because God intended for you to be there. I think that we need to open up our hearts to that more than we normally do. I just want you to know that your being here or being somewhere where you had to go for whatever reason isn't an accident. And if you're a guest in our room or a guest watching online, I want you to know That it's not an accident that you're here this morning. It's not an accident that for whatever reason you woke up today and you said, I think I'll watch Redbud Baptist Church this morning. It's not an accident. You are not here by accident today. God wanted you to hear this message. And as we examine this story, there are four things that I want us to notice in the story. But first, let me tell you, in his gospel, John tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Never forget that. God loved the world. It is God who initiated. God started it. God loved the world first. He created the world. He made the humanity in it. He made everything else in it. God loved first. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul wrote these words, But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was God who initiated. It was God who started. It was God who came looking. Then Jesus also said these words, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. It is God who loved the world first. It is God by His Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross first. It is God who came to seek and to save the lost. Never forget that. God initiated the plan. This is not a plan that was devised in the heart of man. This is not a plan that was devised in the head of man. This is a plan that was devised from eternity past, from before the beginning, by God Himself to redeem humanity from their lostness. It was God who did it first. And if it was God who did it first, then he must know exactly what he's doing. Jesus came looking for you, and he came looking for me. He is very interested in you as he was in seeking out this particular woman from Samaria. And for those of you watching online and here in this room, I want you to know that. Jesus came looking for you. He came looking for me. So interested was Jesus Christ in you that he came looking. He came seeking. Where are you? Where are you? Where have you been? What have you done? How have you lived? Jesus came looking for you. It is no accident. And it is no accident that God puts you in front of people 
that you might share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the four words that I want you to notice this morning, the first thing that I want you to notice is that we have in this story an encounter. We have in this story an encounter. When one examines this story, it is hard not to notice certain barriers. When you look at the story, when you read the rest, all of the story, it's hard not to notice some barriers. And let me mention some of those barriers for you. There is a religious barrier. He was a Jew. She is a Samaritan. The Jews worshiped in Jerusalem's temple, the Samaritans on Mount Gerizim. There's also an ethnic barrier. She is a Samaritan. He is Jewish. There's no love loss between these two groups. They don't like each other. We see a gender barrier. It was not common to see a man speaking with a woman in this fashion. You can think of that whatever you want, but that was the truth. The religious leaders of Jesus' day would rather walk across the street than cross paths with a woman. Some would thank God that they were not born a woman. That wasn't always, that's not always the case with everyone, but that was the case with many of those people. That was part of society at that time. Then there is, of course, the moral barrier. As you will soon acknowledge or will soon see, uh, and she will acknowledge to her, to, to her, Jesus is a prophet. And she, as Jesus will discover in just a moment, of a not-so-good reputation. Two different people from two different societies, two different upbringings, totally different cultures, maybe even some language barriers there. We don't know. But we know that Jesus was able to speak to her and she to him. How many people do you run into every day that are totally different from you? Raise different, talk different, act different, live different, do all of those things different from you. In many cases, nothing in common with those people at all. And so we assume automatically that because we have nothing in common, we must not be able to communicate, and that's just not the truth. That's just not the truth. You'd be surprised how quickly people can communicate when they need to. Have you ever been in those situations? I remember <clears throat> growing up in Morton, Texas. I was still a little kid, but I remember, I remember some uh, Mexican workers who would come and work on the farm, and if my dad wasn't around, the, the, the boss man had to communicate with those guys, and they didn't speak any English, and he didn't speak any Spanish whatsoever. I think those people invented sign language. They would point, and they would put out fingers and sit, do this, that, and the other, and finally, ultimately, one day, they would just come together, and they would, oh, we agree, okay, now we know what we're supposed to be doing, and all that kind of stuff. Church, if you really want to reach people, you'll do everything in your power to overcome those barriers. Barriers are not a reason and an excuse for us not to reach people. Jesus ran into those all the time. And it is here that I want to remind us of the words of the Apostle Peter. Peter began to speak, and he said these words, Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. This, of course, Peter said in his experience with Cornelius, you remember the Gentile? God gave him a vision. God spoke to Peter. Peter refused to eat, and God taught him what he was trying to do. And the next thing you know, Peter is in front of Cornelius and realizing that God has chosen Cornelius to reach another group of people. The Apostle Paul, when speaking to the Galatians concerning their salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, said, For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And what Paul is referencing here is 
he's referencing our salvation. Nothing else, no other subject, it's salvation. And what he is saying is that Jesus is no respecter of persons, as Peter said. When it comes to salvation, Jesus Christ wants everyone to be saved. Amen? Jesus wants every human being to come to the, knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We should want the same thing. It's to see everybody saved. Do we, is everybody going to be saved? I don't think so, but I hope so. And we should do everything in our power, individually and collectively, to make sure that every person hears the gospel and has an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, and they might say no. That's our calling. That's our responsibility. We should do that. And so you have in this story an encounter with, a, with the Lord Jesus Christ and a Samaritan woman. Let me show you something else in the story. Oh, by the way, this encounter with a Samaritan woman, again, wasn't by chance. It wasn't coincidence or an afterthought thought on the part of Jesus. As we already read in verse 4, the Bible tells us that he had to travel through Samaria. Can you imagine going out of your way And, 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 but in this case, Jesus going right through where he normally or normally people would go out of their way and around not to go there. And Jesus said, nope, today I must travel through Samaria. Jesus had an appointment that day. Maybe Jesus has an appointment with you today. Maybe it's for you to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for the first time in your life, whether you're watching or here in the room. Or maybe it's for you to come to the place where you understand that even you have been called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to go out of your way or to go in directions that you may not be willing to go or have not up until this point. It wasn't an accident. And it's not an accident that you're here today. I want you to know this morning that Jesus came for you. Jesus is here in this place. And if you're watching online, Jesus is right there where you are. And let me also say to those of us who are already believers, as I've mentioned to you already, the people that God puts in your life is no accident. You may have 10, 15, I don't know how many people around you, but out of that group, there's somebody there for some reason, and you begin to have a heart for that individual or two or three in that group, and you just be, begin to be concerned about that person for some reason, some odd reason, because while you care for all of them, you don't seemingly have the concern for some of the others in the group. But there's this one person that for some reason God has laid upon your heart and you don't know why. I can tell you why. God wants you to talk to them. God wants you to speak to that person. Don't miss that opportunity. As we've already said, sometimes we wonder why I'm here. What possible business do I have in this store, this meeting, or whatever? Maybe God sent you there. Keep asking those questions. God will reveal it to you shortly. And when he does, be quick to be obedient. Why? Because someone's soul is at stake. Someone's eternal destiny is at stake. I want you to think about that. We have an encounter in the story. You've heard the expression, Jesus loves you just the way you are. But I want you to know that that is a partial truth. He died while you were still a sinner, but he didn't die to leave you that way. Jesus has something greater for you in mind. I hear this from people all the time. Well, God just loves us the way we are. Yeah, he did die for you as a sinner, 
In other words, he didn't say, clean up and then I'll die and then you'll be saved. No, he died for you as sinners. So yes, God loved us while we were yet sinners, the Bible says, but he did not die to leave you there. He did not die to leave you practicing the lifestyle that you've been practicing before you came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We need to preach that from the pulpits more often and from our Sunday school classes and from our conversations with people because you're running into people all over the place who are saying, well, you know, God loves me the way I am. Yes and no. And you and I get to explain the no part. Which leads me to the next word that I want us to notice. We have in this story an encounter, but we also have in this story exposure. Exposure. Jesus comes to this woman, and they begin to have a religious conversation about worship. He's already had a conversation with her about living water. He asked her for water, and he told her, if you knew who I am, you would be asking me for living water, and she continues the conversation, but when it gets close, she pivots, and she begins to talk about something else. You'll know that when you begin to talk to people about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the things that people will always do is they'll pivot in a different direction. And that's just Satan's way of distracting you from where you need to go and to lead you into a different direction. Don't let them do that if you're sharing the gospel. Jesus didn't let her get away with that. When she says to him in verse 15, sir, The woman said to him, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Jesus now exposes her lifestyle. He doesn't say, here's the living water. He says, there's a requirement first. There's an expectation. And Jesus says, go call your husband. He told her, and come back here. You see that? Jesus didn't allow her to remain where she was. Jesus didn't let her stay in the situation that she was in. Jesus didn't say, I love you. It's okay. It's going to be all right. Uh, We'll just love each other and we'll help you and and we'll just kind kind of nudge you along. No. He exposed something in her life that was not right, that was going to be a hindrance to a relationship with God, and he said to her, go get your husband. And she said, correctly, I don't have a husband, she answered. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I don't have a husband. In other words, basically what Jesus is saying to her is that you have made a right confession. You have made a confession that is true. You have done well. You didn't try to hide it. You didn't try to pretend. You didn't try to clean it up, wash it up, make it look pretty. You confess a reality. You currently do not have a husband. And then Jesus blows her mind away when he says, For you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband, What you have said is true. Do you see that? Do you see that Jesus didn't allow her to make an excuse to pivot in a different direction, but he confronted her with her sin. He confronted her with her sin and said, there's a problem in your life. The current man that you live with is not your husband, and you have had five in your lifetime. Church, listen to me very carefully, and I hope if you're here and you've, and you've never had a, 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 an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're watching online, but let me first talk to us as a church. Church, we need to love people. We need to love them with all of our heart. We need to be respectful of people, and we need to be honorable to people. But we have been called to bring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to people in the current lifestyle that they are living, which is contrary to God, 
And if they're living that lifestyle, it is the gospel, it is only the gospel who will convict the heart of their sinful living and change the heart and make it right before God. Only the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit can do that in the heart of somebody. And it is wrong for us to let them stay there by sugarcoating what their lifestyle is so that they can just walk away and feel good about their lifestyle. Jesus didn't let this woman off the hook. He loved her too much to let her off the hook. He went there purposely to reach this woman. Why would you travel so far and risk so much and not tell this person the truth? Why would we be call ourselves a church or call ourselves Christians and not take the opportunity to love people, care for people, but say, hey, your lifestyle is not right with God. You need Jesus Christ in your life to change you. Why would we as Christians live a different life because God changed us, but not go over to other people and say, hey, man, listen, I want to tell you about Jesus because the lifestyle that you're carrying on right now is not going to get you to heaven. It's not going to get you right with God. There needs to, a transformation needs to happen in your life, and it needs to happen today because you don't have long to live. Somewhere along the way, many churches lost their way when it comes sharing the gospel and loving people enough to tell them the truth. No wonder, no wonder we have so many people sitting in our churches who have no relationship with Jesus Christ at all because they've never really been shared the gospel. They don't understand what it means. They've never been told that they need to repent of their sin and ask God for forgiveness. They just said, if you'll just start coming to church, start carrying a Bible, and try to clean up your life as best as possible and make it look good, you'll be okay. Some, someday, somehow, you'll get into heaven. Jesus didn't let her off the hook. He exposed her. The whole verse, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, that says that while we were yet sinners, God calls us out. While you were a sinner, while you were in sinful living, I came, I sent my son to die for you. God made that abundantly clear. People say, well, God made abundantly clear his love. Yes, he did. He made his love abundantly clear, but he also said, I came to die for your sin. That's abundantly clear. And we need to make that abundantly clear when we're sharing the gospel with people. Would you be willing to turn away from your current lifestyle, abandon it, and die to self to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? I'm going to take a moment right now. I don't know if this is good or not, but I'm going to do it. <clears throat> I would encourage every single one of us in, in sitting in this room right now to go buy a ticket to go see a movie called The Forge. Go see that movie. If you listen to that movie, it'll change your life. It'll change your attitude as a Christian. It'll change who you are as a believer, and you'll do everything in your power to do what they're doing in that movie. Jesus exposed her. But we also have in this story an explanation. We have an explanation. You see, Jesus didn't just expose her sin. He didn't just call her out and embarrass her. He told her the truth. In her response, she said, Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. There she is pivoting again. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Now she's making it about worship. And listen to what Jesus tells her. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming. Listen to this. But an hour is coming and now is here, right now, when the true worshipers, the real worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. 
what he's telling the woman? He's saying to her, hey, forget the mount and forget the temple. Where you got to get right with God is not whether you, you're worshiping on the right mountain or the right temple. What you got to get right with God and going forward from here on out, what you got to get right is how you're worshiping from your heart. Who you're worshiping from your heart. Are you worshiping him in spirit and in truth? Have you come to the place in your life where you realize that it's not about the building, it's not about the mountain, it's not about the denomination, it's not about any of that stuff? Have you come to the place where in your heart you have been transformed by the power of God through the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've been transformed and changed. And from that moment on, your life is totally different. You don't go back to who you were before. I want to tell you, if that never has happened, and I say this with as much love as I can, and I say it to the audience on TV, if that has never happened, If you had a religious experience, but the day you walked out of that building, you've lived the same way all of your life. You've never been born again. You're lost, and if you die in that condition, you will die and go to hell for eternity. It's time that God's people start lovingly, caringly tell the truth and ask people to make a real choice to surrender and walk away from that old lifestyle. Jesus explains to her what must happen in this very moment. She says one more thing. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. Now she realizes She's heard enough. She's heard enough truth to know that the Messiah is coming, who is called a Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Now watch this. At that very second, Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. And it's almost as if Jesus says, what are you going to do about that? Now she has a choice to make. I am, I, the one speaking to you, is he. What are you going to do? Well, how do we know that she had a life-changing experience? Remember, the Bible says, by your fruits you shall be known. Look at what happened. Just then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? But watch this. Then the woman left her water jar and went into town and told the people. (laughs) What did she go there for to begin with? To get some water. And she hightailed it out away from that well as quickly as she could, and she didn't care about that jar. Her life had been changed. She had met the Messiah that she had heard about all of her life, and she went to go tell somebody. And what we have to close this out is we have an explosion. As Jesus conversates with the disciples, the disciples aren't aware of what this woman has been doing for I don't know how long over in the city of Sychar, where she belongs. Even all those people and all of those women who wouldn't come with her to the well because she was of ill repute or whatever she was, she went back to those people And she said, hey, I found something. And the Bible tells us in verse 39, Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she, listen, testified. He told me everything I ever did. 
No one had ever done that for her. No one had ever called her a sinner away from God. No one had ever said those things. They ostracized her. They hated her. They didn't like her. They didn't go with her to the well. That She wasn't part of the crowd. She didn't, wasn't included in the social clubs or whatever. No one ever did that for her except this man was willing to sit down with her by the well and tell her the truth long enough that she could know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And she was so grateful that she ran back into that very town that didn't like her, and she told everyone that she could what Jesus did for her. She was a witness. She was a witness. Are we witnesses? Are we witnessing of the love of God? Are we witnessing of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we telling other people? I'm not asking you if you go to church. I'm not asking you if you go to Bible study. I'm not even asking you if you're a member of this church or any church. And for those of you watching online, I didn't ask any of those questions. I asked you, have you come to the place in your life where you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior because you repented of your sin and asked him to forgive you? If you've never done that, I urge you, I plead with you today to do that if you've never done it. I'm going to ask our team to come. And as they make their way, you prepare your heart. Some of us in here this morning, watching online, maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you've never done that, would you be willing to do that today? Would you make that choice today? Listen, please don't think that you have another day. I hope you do. I hope you have another year. I hope you have another day. But I can't stand here and guarantee you that. You need to make that choice today. Today is the day of salvation, salvation, the Bible says. If you've never done that, please do it today. You say, how, Pastor? Ask God above to forgive you of your sin. And you tell him that you repent of all that sin today and that you believe that Jesus died for you, that he resurrected, that he is Lord and you receive him as your Lord and Savior right now, you do that. I'm going to ask you to bow your head right there where you are. If you've never prayed that prayer, and you've ne maybe you prayed it and you weren't sincere. Maybe you prayed it and your life hasn't been any different. You're still the same. You're still doing the same old things. No change in your life. No change in your family's life. None whatsoever. Listen, be honest. Your soul's eternity is at risk, and so is the soul of a whole lot of other people. This is not a game. And if you've never done that, would you do that right now? Would you pray to God like this? God in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I repent of my sin right now and I ask you to forgive me. I believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and paid my debt in full. I believe that he rose on the third day just like he said he did and he ascended into heaven. And I believe that he's coming back. And right now I confess him as my Lord and as my Savior. If you prayed that prayer, just a moment, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. And I'm going to urge you to do it as quickly as you possibly can. Some of you in here this morning, you're a believer. You know Jesus. You know you're saved. You know you're going to heaven. There's somebody around you you need to share the gospel with. You need to share the gospel with them. Sit them down and share the gospel as quickly as you possibly can. You need to ask God to give you a heart for evangelism, a heart for soul winning, a heart for seeing lost people for who they are, lost in their sin, dead in their sins and trespasses, needing salvation. And you won't know that until you ask. Father, I come to you now, and Lord, I pray that you move in the hearts of people this morning and online as well. If they have never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Father, but they prayed that prayer, Father, I pray that you help them to do that and then follow up with the decision that they need to make. Lord, I pray for every single person in this room. God, I pray that out of this church you begin to raise evangelists, people who have been called by you to be evangelists, men who, God, you've given them the gift to be an evangelist. And they, they have that gift and they can do it because you have empowered them to do it. But Lord, I pray that you raise out of our church 
soul winners, people who are willing to share the gospel with people because there's so many who are lost and that is your heartbeat. I pray that you do that. I pray, Lord, that right now they would be praying, oh God, make me a soul winner. Oh God, teach me how to share the gospel. Give me a burden for the lost. May they do that now. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing this song for just a little bit. I know we're running short on time now. But would you stand? And if God spoke to your heart, if you're online, please, there's a number that will appear on the screen. Text the word life to that number and say, Pastor, I prayed the prayer to receive Christ. What do I do next? That's all you got to ask. Give us a contact information and we will reach out to you. And we will be at your front door as quickly as we possibly can to tell you what you need to do next. God spoke to your heart and you're in the room and you need to pray, come. Come to the altar. We'll pray with you. If you prayed that prayer and you need to pray with me, come right now. Don't hold back. And I hope God spoke to your heart about being and sharing the gospel. Ron, would you lead us as we sing for just a moment? God spoke to your heart. Act on it now, right now. Do it. Sing.